association. It was my first time ever at association. We went for a day, but it was wonderful. And um, I really enjoyed the worship that um, Washington Seventh Day um, Baptist had for us. And as much as I love being up here and playing piano, sometimes it's nice to forget, you know, chord sheets and set progressions and, you know, making sure that everyone is playing on the same notes and just have my hands completely free to raise up and praise God. So I really um, felt blessed to do that. Um, but I also love to play and I love to worship. So let's, um, let's praise God together. Amen. 
you, Father.
continue our worship by reading um, our scripture of the morning, which is um, taken from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 36. That's Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 36. I'll read it in your hearing from the NASB. But in those days after this tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest ends of the earth and from the farthest ends of heaven. Now learn the parable from a fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happen, recognize that, the, that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on alert. Therefore, be on alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should, su he should suddenly come and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on alert. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Now let's stand as we sing our hymn meditation, page 430, I Must Tell Jesus.
good Sabbath again. Yesterday I had the extreme joy <coughs> of being at Perry Wood Elementary School, not too far from here. One of the schools that we help supply school supplies, paper and pencils and that sort of thing. I had the privilege of speaking to a third grade class, two fourth grade classes and a fifth grade class about my job. And there's various categories that uh, they have listed there. And one of them is a community servant. That's me. And so I had my name tag. And it had community servant on it. I loved, I loved children. <clears throat> and I loved their responses. I met future rock stars, future wrestlers and boxers, future doctors and lawyers. I even met a young lady who wants to be the first female president of the United States. She's a fifth grader. They are amazing, and, and although I don't get an opportunity many times to interact with young people, yesterday morning was, was really special. Took me back to when our children were little. How many of you parents have heard this? Are we there yet? We heard it all the time because we had the, the opportunity to do some traveling, and our children were always ones that said, are we there yet? Sometimes we just get out of the driveway and are we there yet? I find myself, the older I get, asking that same question as it concerns the end of time. Now I know we don't like to think about that. I shared with my Sabbath school class this morning that many times our vision is very short-sighted. We can only think about those things that, that are right before us. But God says that we should have an eternal perspective. That we should make decisions and be obedient based upon not just what is going on around us today, but with eternity in mind. There's a lot going on in our world today. A lot of things that we don't understand. And sometimes it seems as though God has pulled back, as though God is not active. And yet I'm one of those people that believe that God is always breaking in to our world. That God is always revealing himself. If we but have open eyes and open ears and open hearts and open spirits to see it. I think it happens as we encounter people, certain people that God puts in our pathway. Once a month, I have breakfast with Reverend Ron James. Ron was here last week. I understand that it was a good sermon that he preaches, and he does. He's a marvelous preacher, but more than that, he's a man who loves the Lord, and he's a man who has an eternal perspective. He is a man who knows that the life that he's living, he's in his 70s now. He uh, has been a pastor. He is retired. He knows that one day, this life on earth for him is going to end. Now, it doesn't keep him from doing the things that he does. And all you have to do is spend some time with Ron, as I've been able to do over the 20-some years that we've known each other. And know that he is a man that loves life. And he sees life from an eternal perspective. You know, we get caught up in a lot of the mundane things. A lot of the, the silliness that goes on in our world today. And, and people respond in different ways. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned. But you know what? There are just some things that are just so silly that they don't even, I mean, why should we even be concerned over them? 
And yet there are other things that are happening in our world today that we need to be concerned about. Maybe they're just the little things, but we need to have that eternal perspective. And sometimes I find myself doing this. I find myself in my prayer time saying to the Lord, are we there yet? Are we there there are many people that say that we're close to the time when the Lord is coming back. But didn't we just read or have read for us this morning in Scripture that even the disciples thought that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime? And if you read farther on in the book of Matthew, he said, you know, you see all these things, uh, earthquakes in diverse places and so forth, and all that is is the beginning of birth pangs. Well, you know what? I think that the world today is in birth pain. You know? But God still intervenes, and God still is, is <clears throat> powerful. He's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. And He comes and He intervenes in life. So that no matter what is happening around us, no matter how difficult things get, no matter how difficult family problems get, no matter how difficult physical problems get, that God is always intervening. God is always bringing hope into lives where there seems to be no hope. Do you believe that? Do you believe that, that God is active in our world today? Say amen. amen. How many of you believe that God's got it all under control? Say amen. amen. You see, man is the person... Man is the, the, the group of people that has things out of control. God is the one who has everything in control. And I believe that. You know, I, I don't want to uh, run away, find an island. Wouldn't it be neat to find an island where nobody lived but you? There's a story. You know, even in that situation, there would be a problem. You know, relationships are problems sometimes. This man was on a desert island all by himself, and he was there for about 30 years. And finally he was rescued, and the ship came to rescue him, and they saw three huts built on the shore of this island. And the fellow that rescued them said to the man, Okay, you're here by yourself. Tell me about the three huts. And he said, well, this first one over here is where I live. The one on this side is the church I go to. The one in the middle is the church I used to go to. <laughs> Relationships are hard. You know, and things seem to be out of control, and yet God intervenes. And so I want to give to you an acrostic this morning of the word hope, because I believe that our God is a God of hope. I believe that our God is a God of miracles. I believe that our God is active and even intervening into our world, even as we speak. And these are really responses to the God of hope. I had an opportunity, as I said yesterday, to talk to these children about what it means to be a community servant. Now, and so I was Mr. Taylor, not Reverend Taylor, but I was Mr. Taylor, and underneath it was community servant. And I asked them if they understood or had any idea what that meant. Because after all, I was sitting in front of future rock stars, wrestlers, you know, even the future president of the United States. <coughs> What did they see? How did they view what it meant to be a community servant? And they really didn't have any idea. And so this is what I told them. I said a community servant is one who sees the need in the community in which they live and then does something about that need, responds to that need, <clears throat> and sometimes without ever looking to be paid for it. And they just all kind of went, whoa. 
I'm going, to me, that's what a community servant is. Guess where I went next? Why do I feel that way? Because I'm a Christian. And I'm also a pastor. And I did that in all four of the classes and was able to share my faith in Jesus Christ. And he is the reason that I do what I do. One fourth grade class when I finished and I got ready to leave, the children all jumped up and they said, can we have your autograph? <laughs> I had the opportunity to tell them this. You know, many times being a community servant means that nobody wants your autograph. That you do it without recognition, you do it without renumeration. Amen? That's what God calls us to be. So I want to challenge you in this day when the world seems to be falling apart, to be active in your faith, and to look for those, and I want to give you this acrostic of hope. Probably not very theological, but very practical. As we look to the end, or we look for the coming of the end, the time when Jesus comes, when Jesus takes everything that is wrong in this world and puts it right. When we go to a place where there is no tear, there is no pain, there is no suffering. When we are released from the life that we live, sometimes a life of pain, sometimes physical pain, sometimes mental anguish, sometimes spiritual struggle. There's going to come a day when you and I are released from that. But God is a God of hope. And so I would give to you this this morning. The thought that I would that I would give you is simply this. It's not about us. It's all about God. And so write this down. We are being called, or we are called in 2 Corinthians 5.20, ambassadors. And so the H in hope stands for help others. Help others. See the need. And when the need is presented, then do something. Help others. We are called ambassadors. And we all know what an ambassador is, don't we? The United States has ambassadors. Other countries have ambassadors that they send to, to us. But our ambassadors serve in other countries. And when they speak... It's as if President Obama is speaking. They have that authority. So that when an ambassador says this or gives a statement to a country, it's as though the President of the United States was standing there. Now, Paul says that you and I are ambassadors. Wow. How about that? Everybody say, I am an ambassador of Christ. I am an ambassador of Christ. You know what that means? That means that the words that we speak need to be the words of God Himself. We need to be speaking life and hope into the lives of people. Because God is a God of hope. Amen? Amen. And so we need to be speaking as an ambassador. But in order for us to speak as an ambassador, we have to hear what our president is saying. What our God is saying. We just can't go running off at the mouth. <coughs> we are to give people what God gives to us. Remember these words in 1 Corinthians. When the Apostle Paul was, was giving them instructions about communion. This is what he said. That which I receive. I pass on to you. That's what an ambassador does. That which I receive from God, I pass on to you. And part of that, as an ambassador, means that we are to help others. That we are to be looking for those times, those places where we can help. 
The O stands for obey God. One thing about an ambassador, an ambassador must obey the one that he represents. Amen? If an ambassador doesn't obey the President of the United States, that ambassador is replaced. If the ambassador gives a statement that is not in line with what the President says, he is replaced. Our obligation is that we are to be so close to God that we can hear from God. That we can obey God. That when He sends us, we can go. We are to be and to live not as the world lives, but we are to live as God desires us for living, as God tells us to live. Obedience also unlocks understanding. You know, without understanding, without a vision, without revelation, it says in Proverbs, the people perish. You and I have all of this knowledge that we've been given, but if we don't understand how to use it, if we don't employ wisdom, then what we find is we get in trouble. Amen? Amen. And so we need to obey the, the <coughs> one who sends us. So that when he says to help this person, that we're ready to help. It's looking out, as Paul said in, his, in the epistles, he says, looking out for others, giving preference to others more than you give preference to yourself. That's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? You know, because we get so, you know, we have our needs and we have our desires and we even have our agendas. But remember what I said, this is not about us. It's about God. This life that you and I live is not about you and me. It is about God. It's not just for pastors and deacons. It is for each and every one who claims the name of Christ. Paul just didn't say, some of you are ambassadors. He said to the church, you are ambassadors. And so therefore we have that obligation, if you will, to not only be ready to help others, but also obey God. The I, I'm sorry, the P is to persevere. It's a major theme in Scripture. And we sang that in the second hymn. You know, if we are faithful, we'll get the victory. The victory over what? The victory over sin. The victory over that which tends to enslave us. In Romans chapter 6, our Sabbath school class this morning, we talked about, about how that which we obey, or who we obey, we become a slave to. Oh, well, there are those of you that work. And you have to do what your employer tells you to do. Amen? But there is a danger, is there not? There is a danger that other things can creep in to keep us from living like God would have us to live. And so there's a tension in all of that. Amen? And you understand what I'm saying this morning? Okay? We have a God of hope. And God says to help those around you, to be especially mindful of those who are in the fellowship. When I heard that somebody in Jorge's family died, I, my heart was sad. Because you see, that one person's life affects other people. I may not feel the effect of it, but because Jorge hurts, and he's sad, and because we share the same God, we share the same Holy Spirit, it also affects me. I rejoice, you know, when Larry was talking about his mom and how she called, and, and boy, and how that just made him happy. That made me happy. Amen? Amen? 
So we are to have the needs of others. When I hear about families in crisis, and sometimes there isn't anything I can do about it except to pray. Amen? Amen. So to help others, to obey God, to do what it is that he calls you to do, and then to persevere. I was with these young people, these children yesterday. And when I told them that I was 69 years of age, there was one little boy, his mouth dropped open, and he goes, mm. I said, what did you say? He looked up at me and he goes, you're old. And I said, you better believe it. Say, I'm old, but I'm not ready to quit. Amen? Even though, wouldn't it be so great sometimes just to be able to put it all aside and just rest? Just not do anything, not have any of the response. That's not what God's called me to do. I can't quit. Amen? Amen. See, we need to persevere in our faith. We need to persevere. Now, there are things that I can't do that I did five years ago. There are things that I can't do today that I did 20 years ago, but I'm still not going to quit. Amen? And even though things in this world get kind of, you know, they just kind of seem all out of kilter, all out of focus, I'm still going to persevere. I still believe that God is alive. I still believe that Jesus is alive. I still believe that He's intervening in our world even now. And all I have to do is be in a tune, a tune to that, a tune to God. And I'll be able to see those places, those things that God is doing. Amen? Help others. Obey. Persevere. And then the E. Do all of those things with an eternal perspective. I believe that the best is yet to come. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, and 18 says this. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. In other words, life, this life on earth, is a temporary assignment. Something that is going to pass away. Heaven and earth, it said in Mark, it said heaven and earth are going to pass away. But Jesus said, my words will never pass away. So everything that you and I do, every life, every breath that we take, needs to be done with an eternal perspective. We need to have our eyes fixed upon Jesus. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul. <coughs> the Apostle Paul is in prison. It's not a country club. It's a, it's a dungeon. And he's chained. And it probably was in the sewer <coughs> where all the, the human waste would flow by him. It probably smelled terrible. It smelled worse than the skunk in Brittany's house. Okay? Wasn't something that, that they even took, they put him there for a purpose, and that was because they wanted to, you know, they didn't want him to enjoy life. They wanted him to, to feel down, to feel somehow that, that his life was over, for him to lose hope. It's what Satan does to us. What Satan wants us to do is to lose hope. He wants us to look at our circumstances 
Right? And he wants us to be so consumed with our circumstances that we lose hope. Here's the Apostle Paul down in the dungeon being chained. He knows that the end of his life is near. He knows that it's coming to an end. It is said that while the Apostle Paul was in that kind of a dungeon, that, that they kept having to change the guards all the time because he kept trying to convert them to Jesus Christ, even in that dungeon. And in Philippians, he wrote this, while he was in, dun in the dungeon, rejoice in the Lord. And again I say, rejoice. Here was a man who hadn't lost hope, even though the circumstances that he was in were not the best. He did not lose hope. His hope was in Jesus Christ, that sure hope. He was able to look beyond his circumstances and see, got a glimpse of heaven. I don't know what heaven is like. You know, I guess that depends on who you read. Streets paved with gold. You know, I can't fathom that. You know, walls made of jasper and pearl. I can't fathom that. But I believe that heaven is a real place. And that it's the best place to be. And Jesus came and made it possible for us to go there. But while we're here, he also calls us to be his ambassadors, to help others, to obey him, to make him first in our lives, to persevere no matter what the circumstances are, and always to keep our eyes elevated eternally. That's our God of hope. That's the hope that he gives to this world. So you and I are called to share words of hope. Words of vision. Words that will uplift. Words that will encourage. Words of hope. My days are numbered. This is a temporary assignment for me. But I'm an ambassador of Christ. And I'm learning eternal values. As I help others. As I obey God. As I persevere. I have a vision of eternity. It's a challenge in this day and age. But it is one that is attainable. And it's one that God wants us to have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.